Okay, we are picking up in lesson P1 where we left off yesterday. If you recall, we are on the back side, working our way through some inequalities, interval notation, graphing, and just putting it all together. So we're going to finish the notes, and then we should have some work time. I am going to, at the beginning of work time, kind of address what you should be doing in each section. So just kind of, you know, help there a little bit. But we left off where we had to write an interval of real numbers using an inequality and draw the graph. Okay, so writing inequality, we're using the less than greater than signs. Drawing a graph, we're drawing a graph. I've been throwing interval notation in just to practice with you guys a little bit. So the real numbers greater than or equal to zero. Thoughts? How do we write that as an inequality? Yep, that easy. When they talk about the real numbers greater than or equal to zero and they want inequality, you pick the variable. Okay, Ethan said x. I would have said x. You can pick your own variable technically. Greater than or equal to is just greater than or equal to and then zero. Can you visualize that graph? I'm going to put zero on my graph. As I said, I like to have a few other numbers on there. So greater than or equal to zero, where do we go? Going to go to the right. So I'm going to shade to the right. What do I need to do at zero? Okay, a bracket. It's, we would have said in the past a closed circle, but because we're trying to use this interval notation type graphing, we're going to use a bracket. Notice my bracket opens towards where my shading is. Now, again, I know they don't ask for it, so if they ask for inequality, this is what I want for inequality. If they ask for a graph, here's a graph. They don't ask for interval notation, but that's new to us, so it's good practice. Read left to right. Where does my graph start? Where does the shading start here? Zero. So interval notation starts with a zero. And the zero comes with a bracket, comma. Where does my shaded interval end? Yeah. That right arrow is represented by pause and infinity. What do infinities always use? Parentheses. Whether it be positive or negative infinity, it always has a parenthesis with it, never a bracket. Yeah, I mean, because remember, a bracket includes the endpoint. With infinity, there is no endpoint, so there's nothing to include there. Okay. Jumping down to the next line, they ask us to convert interval notation to inequality or vice versa. So on A, they're giving us interval notation. The interval from negative 6 to 3, bracket with negative 6, uh, parenthesis with 3. We want to convert it. So we want to write that as inequality. So instead of parentheses, brackets, and a comma in between, we want to use less than, greater than, x's thrown in there. Now, one thing that might help if you're kind of sitting here thinking, I don't know how to get from there to an inequality, can you visualize what the graph from negative 6 to 3 looks like? What's the graph from negative 6 to 3 look like? This is just a quick little quick little graph there. The shading would be where? In between negative 6 and 3, yes. There would be a bracket at negative 6 and a parenthesis at 3. So that's what you're trying to write inequality for. How do you write inequality for that? It would be like the negative 6 and then like the sine x. Uh huh. Yep. We're going to, this is going to be the type where, because the shading's in the middle, that's what we typically call an and statement. So we put x in the middle, 3 on the right, negative 6 on the left. When you do these and statements, I don't know, I don't know that I said yesterday, but I know last year I'd always say it, both signs, they always face the same direction. 
And assuming you got the bigger number on the right, both signs are always less than signs. Now, officially one of these needs to be a less than or equal to. Well, except because we're doing inequality, we don't use bracket and parentheses. Okay, yeah, this is where I'm trying, I need you guys to sort out what's an inequality, what's interval notation. That's the hardest part of this, honestly. Okay, so they gave us interval notation. It had no x's, no less than greater than signs. Now we need an inequality. There's no comma, there's no parentheses brackets. Okay, that's kind of the trade off there. And notice, does this make sense? If you block that off, x less than 3, yeah, my shading is x less than 3. If we block this off, read it backwards, x greater than or equal to negative 6, and that's x greater than or equal to negative 6. Okay. Again, I'm not saying you had to do that little graph sketch up there. It's just an easy way for me to teach it in the beginning. Okay. Questions? Okay, let's try B. B is negative infinity to negative 1. Can you visualize that? I mean, technically, all I need is the inequality. But if it helps, what's that graph visualize as? If it's negative infinity to negative 1, where is the shading? Yeah, because the shading starts at negative infinity, doesn't it? And goes up to negative 1. And it has a parenthesis there. So there's your visual for the graph. What's the inequality for that? X less than negative one. You've been doing that since early middle school, I would say. Just writing, or I would think early middle school. Maybe algebra one easily, so just being able to take a graph and write an inequality for it. Yeah, we did it in middle school too, I think, so. Okay, C. This time we're reversing. They're giving us inequality, it says less than greater than, so it has an x. We need to write the interval notation. Can you write the interval notation without a graph? I'm not saying you have to, but where's my interval start at? Negative 2. What's negative 2 have with it? A bracket because it's equal to. Where's my interval end? Three, and what's three half? A bracket. Okay. The idea is where is the shading here? The shading on this is between negative two and three, isn't it? Because it's an and statement, the shading is between, and so that's why my interval is the type with x in the middle. Okay. Think you can handle that a little bit in homework? Hopeful, maybe. Okay, um, the next section basically lists properties of algebra. You have been using a lot of these properties, honestly, some of them since elementary. Okay, um, you use them, whether you remember them by name, I don't know, but you've seen all these names. So commutative property, x plus y equals y plus x, that just means that 2 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 2. That works for addition. That also works for multiplication. Okay. Associative property. This is saying if you have three items that you're either adding or multiplying, it doesn't matter the order. So here we have x plus y plus z. I could add y plus z first here, or over here I could add x plus y first. It's not going to matter the order I add. Same would be true of multiplying. multiplying. Distributive property. We know that one, right? x times y plus z means you have to distribute and multiply the x times y, the x times z. Okay, identity properties. Identity properties, what do you add to keep the same thing and what do you multiply to keep the same thing? So what do you add to x to still equal x? And that is zero. So zero is the additive identity because that's what you add. You know, identity, how do we keep it the same? So in adding, we add zero. In multiplying, we're going to 
multiply by 1. How do you keep x the same by multiplying? You multiply by 1. So those are your identities. And then the inverse property is how do I get the identity? So in adding, the identity is 0. How do I take x and get 0? Well, you take x and you add the opposite of x, the negative of x, and you get 0. So a number plus its opposite equals 0. In multiplying, you're probably not going to like this form. It says a number times a number to the negative first equals 1. You guys would probably be more comfortable if I said x times, what if I said 1 over x? A number times its reciprocal. So if you take 2 times, say, 1 over 2, that's how you get 1, okay? Or 3 times 1 over 3, a number times its reciprocal is how you multiply to get 1. x to the negative first is the same thing as saying 1 over x, okay? Those sound familiar, I'm assuming, okay? It's just a matter of knowing that you've used those. can't remember, oh, I haven't glanced fully at the homework this morning, I looked at it a little bit, but... If you have to identify them, make sure you state whether it's addition or subtraction along with it. And I'll talk about that homework here in a moment. Um, exponential notation, a to the n, a little bit of vocabulary. a is the base in that situation. m is the exponent. Basic vocabulary. Okay. Properties of exponents. Again, pieces you should know, but just kind of reviewing here. If you were multiplying two expo exponential terms, they have the same base, u to the m times u to the n. Remember, you keep the base the same and add the exponents. That's when you're multiplying. If you're multiplying, you keep the base the same and add the exponents. However, when you're dividing, if the base is the same, you keep the base the same and subtract the exponents. Okay, anything raised to zero power is always one. You need to know that. Hello. Uh-huh. Are you, is it the... So the one for 20, the 21-22 school year? Uh-huh. Right? No, if it says course ID, that would be the one from the course you created. When you create your course, there's an ID in there somewhere that you have to give the students. Yes. They'll put the school access, so they'll put that in, then they'll put some other information in, they'll put the school access code in, and then they'll have to re-enter that same course ID number again later in the process, if I recall. But... Yeah, try having them use that other number and see if that works. You're welcome. That's right. Bye. Okay. Where was I at here? Let's see. I think I said anything raised to zero is one. Is that about where I left off? Okay. Negative exponents. Do you remember how to work with negative exponents? We can't. It's not proper form to leave a negative exponent. So to leave it, to get rid of a negative exponent, you move it. To the denominator, or officially you move it across the fraction bar, right? So if it's a negative exponent, you move it to the denominator. If it happens to be a negative exponent in the denominator, to make it positive, you move it up to the top. And then over here to the right are power properties. If you have an exponent outside of power, this is assuming it's um, a product here, that m goes on both pieces, u to the m, v to the m. A power raised to a power, remember if it's a power raised to a power, you multiply. And even if there's division here, that power goes on all pieces. Okay? Not true of addition and subtraction, but it works with multiplication and division. So you will see those rules in use some. Okay? And we're going to practice those here in a little bit too. 
Okay, we do have one more page with these notes, so flip to the next page real quick, please. One last topic I'm going to throw in before we throw in some examples. Scientific notation. We talk scientific notation. I always generally say a number times 10 to some power. And so if we're saying a number times 10 to some power, note where that number has to be a number between 1 and 10. It can be as low as 1.0, and it can go as high as basically 9.999999. Because remember, in scientific notation, you have one digit before the decimal. Okay? So we'll practice a little bit with scientific notation as well. Okay, let's get the easy stuff out of the way. Identify the base and exponent of negative 3 to the fifth. What's the base? Base is what? Negative 3. It's in parentheses. The base is negative 3. What's the exponent? 5. Base is negative 3. Exponent is 5. Easy peasy. If I were to write this problem out longhand, what does negative 3 to the fifth power mean? Okay. So negative 3 times negative 3, times negative 3, times negative 3, times negative 3. Yes? Just basic information there. Now, I go through all that because we now need to talk about B. It's negative 3 to the fifth again. Well, same questions as last time. What are the base and the exponent? Thoughts? Base is three. Base is three? Ah. Because there's no parentheses there, does it sound familiar? That base is just a whole number three. And what's the exponent, of course? Five. Now, what's the difference mathematically in how I figure this out? If there's a negative in the parentheses, then negative, like, so it's like negative 3 to the fifth in parentheses, it's negative 3 times itself 5 times. Right. And if it's just negative 3 to the fifth, no parentheses, it's 3 times itself 5 times, and then the negative stays on whatever number you get. Okay, yeah, so what I think about is I just think if there's one negative, it's, it is, it's hard to explain. I get it, you know, I think of it, I just kind of put one negative out front, and then what this is, is it is 5 threes. Okay, so there's, it's not a matter of, in that case, multiplying the negatives to see how many negatives there are and what that means. That's just saying it's going to be negative. So over here, negative 3 to the fifth, it could be a positive or a negative depending on the power. Over here, negative 3 to the fifth without, this is guaranteed to be a negative. Okay, your calculators work like this also, yes? And I'm not even just talking about the graphing calculators. Your scientific calculators. Did you run into that sometimes last year? I always say, use your brain. Think about it. Because if you just do, and with an odd power, it's not going to matter. But with even powers, it would matter. If you just throw that in there, your calculator has to have the parentheses when you want it to. So these are going to be the same answer regardless. But just kind of so you know. Okay. Let's try A. It says simplify the following, 2ab to the third times 5a squared b to the fifth. Do you remember how to multiply this stuff? You've been doing it since middle school. Not sure how well we remember it, but thoughts? Can I get shy now? What do you think, Ethan? So, like, you multiply the 2 and 5, so you get 10, then, like, you add the exponents on, like, terms. Uh-huh. Okay. So, we've got whole numbers out front, because these are just, it's one big term times another term. So, multiply the like pieces. 2 times 5 is 10. We have an A, and we have an A to the second. What's A times A to the second? A to the third, because you're adding exponents, right? If the base is the same, 
keep the base, add the exponent. b to the third times b to the fifth, b to the eighth. Unfortunately, so many ways you could have gone wrong on that, right? So many ways you can go wrong. So just kind of remember the details, but when you're multiplying a term times a term, put the like pieces together. Okay, what about b? It's division instead of multiplication, so what's division mean I need to do? Subtract the exponents. So look at your u's. For the u's, it's going to be u to the what? The third, yes. You guys okay with the third? Because you're doing what? Two minus negative one is the powers you're subtracting. And two minus negative one is three. V to the what? V to the what? Negative fifth. Because it'd be negative two minus three, which is negative five. Now, Officially, you should not leave a negative exponent in the final answer. We're going to be official and formal here. So how do I write this answer without the negative exponent? Okay, so v to the fifth has to go to the denominator, right? Get rid of that negative exponent. What about u to the third? Does it move? So we think of it as staying on top, okay? So I'm going to write this as u to the third over v to the fifth. Are we digging in all the dark corners of your brain here that you've buried all this stuff away? I'm trying. Okay, thoughts on C. X squared over 2, all raised to the negative third power. My personal thought is get rid of that negative exponent first. And what's a negative exponent do? Okay. If it's in the numerator, we move it to the denominator. If it's in the denominator, we move it to the numerator. So here's the easiest thing that I would suggest. Take the negative off of that exponent and flip your fraction. This is a common, I don't know if I want to say shortcut, but a common technique is to say, okay, make that first step. Instead of saying x squared over 2 to the negative third, say it's going to be 2 over x squared. And now it's raised to the positive third. Okay, so we can't really work with negative exponents. We have to get rid of those negative exponents here. That kind of saves us a step. Now, I'm not saying it's the only way you could do it. You could have said, okay, take that negative 3 to both pieces and then flip them later. Now, take one more step, though. We're not done, are we? That exponent of 3 goes with everything, yes? What's that exponent become? What is 2 to the third? 8. What is x to the second raised to the third? It's a power raised to a power. And when it's a power raised to a power, we're going to do what with those powers? Multiply. So it's 8 over x to the sixth. Do we all get that 2 to the third is 8? Those of you that were thinking 6, you got that knocked out of your brains now. Or maybe no one was thinking 6, but usually there's people thinking 6 very easily. Yeah, and oh, with the exponents, yeah, and that's a power raised to a power, so then you're multiplying. Okay, a um, couple handwritten examples in real quick. Expand. How do we expand a plus 2 times x? What are they wanting us to do there? Expand is not our traditional vocabulary word here, but yeah, you're going to take that x and distribute x. So if we take that x and distribute x, x times a is going to be ax or xa, depending on your preference. 
plus x times 2. On that one, I tend to say 2x. Can I go any farther? Can I add those? Nope. We're done. Okay. No farther there. What about e? Is this factor? And that is 3y minus by is what that says, just so you know. How do we factor 3y minus by? Take y out of yeah, there's a GCF of y. Both terms have a common factor of y. So we factor the y out front. And what's left in the parentheses? 3 minus b. And then that's as far as we can go there. Okay, a little bit of scientific notation review. It's probably been a few years since you've taught scientific notation. Oh, no, wait, you guys have science classes. You guys have science classes. You've taught scientific notation at some point, probably. Okay, so remind me, 2.375 times 10 to the 8th. How do I convert that out of scientific notation? Move the decimal place. Eight places, eight places which way? To the right. Okay. Does this mean I add eight zeros? No, you guys are all past that misconception. Because it's a positive eight, I'm going to go over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Which basically means in this case I'm adding how many zeros? Five. So if I Let's see, if I put my commas in, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 237 million 500,000. Remember, always put commas in every three going from the right. If this had been negative exponent, we would have moved our decimal left, made it a smaller number. Okay. What about B? And I know I may not teach this the same way your science teachers teach it, but... As long as you know what you're doing. Okay, I'm not even, this big long decimal. I'm not even gonna try and read it. What are your thoughts about scientific notation here? She says seven to the right. Where's that decimal gonna land then? Yeah, I always try and place that decimal. How do I make 349 a number between one and ten? So to make it a number between one and ten. It's going to be 3.49. And then we're going to say 10 to some power. Whitney counted 7. Hmm? Yeah, there are 7 digits between the two decimals, is what I say. So if there's 7 digits between the two decimals, it is a 7. I personally say because this was a decimal, a small number, it's a negative exponent. I don't try and teach left and right at this point just because... Which, which way are you moving? Are you moving from the old one? Yeah. Ooh, it didn't freeze. It just glitched. Let's convert the following two are from scientific notation. Now, I know some of you have probably already just thrown all these numbers in your calculator and put the final answer in scientific notation. But I'm going to take you, let's work with scientific notation here as we go. Minimize the calculator usage. Yes, I think we might use it a little bit to save time, but... What is 370,000 in uh, scientific notation? 3.7 times 10 to fifth. Okay. Is that 4 billion, 500 million, I think? This is why we use scientific notation, right? 4.5. Times 10 to the ninth, all divided by 18,000, which is what? One point eight times ten to the fourth. Yeah. Okay. Now, officially, how do we do this now that we're in scientific notation? We have two different numbers in the numerator, yes? 
When we multiply in scientific notation times scientific notation, what do we do? 3.7 times 4.5, multiply those, and then 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 9th. So what is 3.7 times 4.5? And this is where write it out by hand or throw it in the calculator. I've written down 16.65 for 3.7 times 4.5. And then what is 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 9th? 10 to the 14th. Bases are the same. Keep the base. Add the exponents. My denominator was already 1.8 times 10 to the 4th. Can we essentially do the same thing now with division? Divide the pieces. What is 16.65 divided by 1.8? 9.25 times, what is 10 to the 14th divided by 10 to the 4th? 10 to the 10th, because we're subtracting our exponents. Always stop and ask yourself at the end before you circle this answer, Am I in scientific notation? And I ask that because occasionally you end up with a number like 92.5 or something where you now have to adjust, right? And so, but in this case, we are in scientific notation. So 9.25 times 10 to the 10th. Okay, if you did not write it down yesterday, write it down today. Page 9. 2 through 22 evens. 37 through 40, realize 37 through 40 is going to be all, right? And then 43 through 45 is going to be all. And 48 to 64, evens. So make sure you have that assignment written down. I will say when I put the assignments in Skyward, sometimes like this it's hard to get it all in. So I sometimes this Skyward have to shorthand it. Um, sometimes, depending on how you're looking at Skyward, it cuts it off in Skyward. So you may have to actually go into Skyward as opposed to going through the app or something like that. So you've got 10 minutes. Not quite as much as I'd hoped, but...